Later this evening, we expect the House to pass Paycheck Protection Program and Health Care Enhancement Act. I'm grateful that Congress is answering my call to deliver these additional $320 billion in relief for the American worker and for small businesses. At a time when many Americans are enduring significant economic challenges, this bill will help small businesses to keep millions of workers on the payroll. You see states are starting to open up now, and it's very exciting to see. I think it's very awe-inspiring. We're coming out of it, and we're coming out of it well. And we're really — I'm very happy the Governor's been — the Governors really have been doing a really good job working with us, and it's uh, — it's really pretty uh, impressive to see. I've spoken to numerous leaders of countries over the last 48 hours, and they are saying we're leading the way. We're really leading the way in so many different ways. Well, I'm also very pleased that Harvard, as you know, Harvard and Stanford and Princeton and numerous other universities and colleges, as also large businesses, have uh, sent funds back to us. And in some cases, I stopped funds at I looked at, and uh, we uh, are pleased to report that the funds have either not gone out or it's about $350 million, and they've either not gone out or uh, we've renegotiated it, and uh, they're not getting them. So uh, in a couple of cases, they're sending them back and sending them back immediately. So I think it was very nice. I want to thank Harvard in particular. They acted very quickly and decisively, and they agreed when they heard the facts that they should not be getting it. So we appreciate it very much from Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and other institutions. The bill also includes $30 billion to support small lending institutions serving distressed communities, helping countless African-American and Hispanic-American small businesses. As we continue our battle against the virus, the data and facts on the ground suggest that we're making great progress. In 23 states, new cases have declined in the peak week. Forty percent of American counties have also seen a rapid decline in new cases. Forty-six states report a drop in patients showing coronavirus-like symptoms. That's a big number. To keep America gaining momentum, every citizen needs to maintain the vigilance, and we all understand that very well. We've gone over it many, many times. This includes practicing good hygiene, maintaining social distance, and the voluntary use of face covering. A safe and phased reopening of our economy. It's very exciting, but it does not mean that we are letting down our guard at all in any way. On the contrary, continued diligence is an essential part of our strategy to get our country back to work, to take our country back. We're winning this, and we're going to win it, and we're going to keep watching. And we're going to watch very closely for the invisible enemy. With each passing day, we're learning more and more about this enemy. The scientists at DHS have released a report offering a number of insights about how the virus reacts to different temperatures, climates, and surfaces. The findings confirm that the virus survives better in colder and drier environments and does less well in warmer and more humid environments. Um, I have to say that, uh, very excitingly, we're going to have somebody up. Bill will be up in just a little while. It was a great report you gave, and he's going to be talking about how the virus reacts in sunlight. You really hear the numbers. You won't even believe them. U.S. trials of the COVID-19 have been uh, going on and have been approved in the United States, Germany, U.K., and China. That's big news. And we're uh, — a lot of trials are going on, and we have a lot of great, brilliant minds working on this, uh, both from the standpoint of a uh, vaccine and therapeutics. We must be careful in all conditions, but we will uh, — we will get this uh, done. We're very close to a vaccine. Unfortunately, we're not very close to testing, because when the testing starts, it takes a period of time, but we'll get it done. And I want to thank uh, the head of uh, DHS Science and Technology, Bill Bryan, for uh, what he's going to be doing and what he's going to be saying and the report that he's uh, about to give. I think it's going to be uh, something that uh, nobody's ever heard. It'll be brand new information and very important information. My administration continues to leverage the Defense Production Act to dramatically increase the manufacture and delivery of critical medical supplies. 
We finalized three contracts to produce 39 million more N95 masks in 90 days. And as you know, we're also using a sterilization process, some uh, great equipment that will sterilize the masks up to 20 times per mask. So that's like ordering 20 times more masks. And it's working very well. We just want the hospitals and the institutions where it is to use it. A lot of people don't use it. They're so used to getting a new mask. They don't want to use it. They want to go and immediately uh, get a new one. We're asking them to use the sterilization process. Every bit is good, up to 20 times. Think of that. In addition to ramping up our domestic assembly lines, we also have airlifted nearly 750 million pieces of personal protective equipment into the United States through our project Airbridge, which has been an incredible thing to watch. It's really a military operation. The Vice President is now providing each governor with an exhaustive count-by-county breakdown of the privately distributed personal protection. And, and this is uh, equipment and things that are incredible. It's personal protective equipment. It's incredible, and it's uh, all brand new and at the highest level. We're getting only the highest level. And uh, also, we're looking at essential gear within their states and is being delivered to different states quickly and as we speak. This way, the governor should know exactly what's being delivered through a private sector supply chain within their states, as well as through the Project Airbridge. We're trying to get it immediately from the plane to the state. When we can't do that, we bring it into our facilities and get it to the governors. And we're getting them fast, and we're notifying them very strongly so they know it's there. Governors can use this information to quickly ensure that they get materials where and when they are needed. Today, I also want to extend my special thanks to our nation's incredible county emergency management teams who have been working relentlessly for weeks around the clock, end on end, to serve their communities, help distribute critical supplies, and save countless American lives. We salute these heroic officials on the front lines. As we continue to develop potential therapies, the FDA has recently begun a national effort to expand access to convalescent plasma donated from the blood of those who have recovered from the virus. The blood of these donors contains antibodies that can potentially reduce the severity of the illness in those who are sick, and frankly, those that are very sick. Nearly 3,000 patients are now enrolled in the Expanded Access Program, receiving transfusions nationwide. And I want to thank all of the people that recovered for what they've done. They, as I said yesterday, they raise their hand when they barely can walk, and they're saying, I want to donate blood, I want to donate whatever it is that you want, because we want to help people. It's really quite incredible. Convalescent plasma will also be used to manufacture a concentrated antibody treatment that does not have to be matched with a particular blood type. This concentrated antibody treatment could be used as a preventative measure to keep healthcare workers and other high-risk po populations from contracting the virus in the first place. Very big deal. Clinical trials of these products are slated to begin within weeks, and we can maybe have a fairly quick Solution, I urge Americans to um, get in there and keep doing what you're doing, because, again, uh, we want those people recovering or recovered from coronavirus to contact their local blood and plasma donation center to learn how they can help. And they've been so great, and I just appreciate it. My administration has also partnered with the leading, and we have really been establishing some great partnerships with leading technology companies and scientific journals to create a database of 52,000 scholarly articles on the virus that can be analyzed by artificial intelligence. Top AI experts are now using this wealth of data to gain insights into potential therapies. And we're collaborating with tech firms, universities, and our national labs to harness American supercomputers in the search for treatments and vaccines. That search is going on, and it's being — I think you'll see in the future, you'll see it's very successful. Ultimately, it'll be a tremendous success. Great progress is being made at a rapid pace, a pace like no other. We have every hope that with the full might and resources of American science and technology and with the courage and devotion, of the American people who have been so incredible. We will end this plague 
And together, we will restore the full measure of American strength and power and prosperity. Our country is going to do fantastically well. You see what's going on. There is a uh, pent-up demand in our country to get it back right where it was and maybe even better, and that's what's going to happen. So with that, I'd like to ask uh, Mike Pence to come up. Vice President, say a few words, please, Mike. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, good afternoon. Today, the White House Coronavirus uh, Task Force met. And while uh, our hearts are with the families of those who have lost their life to the coronavirus and those who are struggling with serious illness today, um, our team, uh, led by Dr. Deborah Burks, informs us that the data continues to show promising signs of progress. In the New York metro area, New Jersey, Connecticut, Detroit and New Orleans all appear to be past their peak, and we are seeing consistent declines in hospitalization and cases in regions across the country. Uh, our only conclusion is that we're getting there, America, because the American people have put into practice the President's guidelines of social distancing because you've been listening uh, and adhering to the guidance of state and local officials. Uh, we are uh, we're making, we're making meaningful progress um, in a very real sense, sparing Americans uh, to be exposed to the coronavirus and, in no less extent, um, saving lives. Our task force actually believes, Mr. President, that if we continue these mitigation efforts in the days ahead, as states implement their policies, including phased reopening that will preserve those gains, we do believe by Early summer, we could be in a much better place as a nation with, uh, with much of this coronavirus epidemic behind us. Earlier today, we also had a conference call led by Secretary Ben Carson uh, and leaders from HUD about the President's announcement yesterday uh, that he is repurposing the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council to focus on the impact of the coronavirus on minority communities. Uh, Secretary Carson will convene the council tomorrow uh, and will be reporting uh, tomorrow afternoon on their progress. We want to thank the more than 270 leaders of organizations dedicated to housing, homelessness, and improving the lives of people across our urban communities, not only for being with us today, uh, for the way they have partnered with our administration and partnered with state and local officials to put the health of all of their constituencies first. As the President uh, mentioned, we'll, you'll receive a report that our task force received uh, formally this week uh, from Bill Bryant of the Science and Technology Directorate at the Department of Homeland Security. He will outline, as the President said, encouraging news about the impact that heat and sunlight have on the coronavirus, which will increase the confidence that we feel about the coming summer. On the subject of testing, uh, at the present moment, we have reports of 4.93 million tests having been performed across America, and encouraging news as states have been engaging commercial labs at a higher level across the country. Uh, yesterday, our commercial lab system did more than 100,000 tests in a single day, so we're beginning to activate all of the capacity. And tomorrow, at the President's direction, our task force will convene a conference call with all of the nation's governors to talk about their progress that they are making on testing, and we're going to hear from governors about uh, the practices that, uh, and, and methods that they are employing to significantly increase testing following our briefing about capacity in laboratories this past Monday. Uh, for instance, Governor Mike DeWine just announced that Ohio's testing has been greatly expanded after the FDA approved Thermal Fisher's new extraction reagent as saying in his words that the action, quote, probably doubled, maybe even tripled testing in Ohio virtually overnight. Governor Tim Waltz of Minnesota announced, that along with the state's health care system, the Mayo Clinic, and the University of Minnesota, what he described as a breakthrough for rapid widespread testing, able to test more than 20,000 people using a molecular test per day. Governor Kim Reynolds of Iowa launched the Test Iowa Initiative that will triple testing capacity by partnering with Nomi Health and Domo. She also worked with the University of Iowa Hospitals to leverage further capacity. And Governor Eric Holcomb and Governor Andy Bashir of Indiana and Kentucky, respectively, both announced additional drive-through testing locations. 
Uh, our priority has always been to focus first on those impacted by the coronavirus and then on those extraordinary health care workers ministering to their needs every day. Uh, and I know, Mr. President, how proud you are uh, that the, our men and women in uniform have come alongside our health care workers in communities most impacted. Uh, and I know the American people are proud as well. As of today, uh, FEMA reports that 35,000 National Guard have been deployed across the country to aid in our coronavirus response. Governor Kevin Stitt of Ohio actually deployed the National Guard to hospitals across the state to evaluate protective equipment and hospital capacity and report it into state emergency management and FEMA. And Governor Greg Abbott of Texas actually mobilized more than 1,200 National Guard and 45 teams to provide greater access to testing. Along with the National Guard, at the President's direction today, more than 4,500 active duty military doctors, nurses, and medical assistants have been deployed across the country. Yesterday, 1,013 medical professionals in our military were actually deployed to 19 hospitals in seven states to support those amazing health care workers. And with 4.4 million more Americans filing for unemployment in the past week, I join the President in welcoming passage in the House today of the Paycheck Protection Program. It will support working families, allow small businesses to keep people on the payroll for a period of two months. But it also, as the President uh, requested, included $75 billion to assist hospitals across the country. And in that spirit, um, the President and I will continue to urge states across the country, given the unique burden on hospitals, uh, we are now encouraging states to restart elective surgeries wherever possible, either statewide or on a county-by-county county basis. Uh, we, we recognize the role elective surgeries play in finances for local hospitals, and we'll be working with states to enable that. In that vein, Governor Doug Ducey uh, issued an executive order not long ago allowing elective surgeries beginning May 1 for hospitals that meet certain preparedness criteria. Uh, and Indiana's Governor Eric Holcomb is allowing elective clinical procedures to begin on April 21st. Finally, Mr. President, the task force received today our first report on state reopening plans. At the present moment, 16 states have re released formal reopening plans. Uh, 13 of those were actually released since um, you unveiled the Opening Up America guidelines to our governors and to the nation last week. And to your point, Mr. President, states are beginning to make those plans. And, and we're encouraged to see so many states embracing the phased approach to reopening their economies that's contemplated in our uh, guidelines for opening up America again. For instance, Governor Mike Parson of Missouri announced the Show Me Strong Recovery Plan has two initial phases intended to protect the most at risk. Governor Tom Wolf announced the plan for Pennsylvania that would begin May 8th. will end a stay-at-home order for just portions of Pennsylvania, but the plan, again, requires regions to have fewer than 50 new positive cases per 100,000 for a period of 14 days, and it also lays out a phased reopening roadmap. Governor Kate Brown of Oregon updated their framework for reopening, doing three phases again on a county-by-county county basis, and Governor Brad Little of Idaho released Rebound Idaho in just the last few days that will consist of four phases and require specific criteria that Idaho and businesses need to meet to begin to reopen. Uh, Mr. President, with the, uh, with the guidelines to open up America again, states are making plans, and at your direction, uh, our task force will continue to work very closely, providing them with the data, providing them with the resources to be able to implement those plans in a safe and responsible way. So with that, let me just uh, end where I began and to say thank you to the American people. The progress that we are seeing is a testament to what all of you have done, to our extraordinary health care workers, to a partnership between the federal government and to state uh, and local official. And, uh, and I'm confident it's also owing to the prayers of millions of Americans each and every day. All of that combined, we're we're slowing the spread. We're protecting the most vulnerable. Uh, we're saving lives. And, and every single day, we are one day closer to opening up America again. Uh, with that, Mr. President, I'd be pleased to call Bill forward. 
Bill Bryant uh, leads the Science and Technology Directorate at the Department of Homeland Security and now will make a presentation on their recent study. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. President, for this opportunity to do this today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Bryan, and I lead the Science and Technology Directorate at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Over the last several months, we've intensified the department's R&D efforts to identify and deliver information that informs our response to COVID-19. S&T is working to identify, develop, deploy, and deploy the tools and information to support our response to this crisis. As part of our efforts, we're leveraging the unique capabilities of S&T's National Biodefense Analysis and Countermeasure Center to study the biology of the COVID-19 virus. This center is a high biocontainment laboratory located in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, it was established in the early 2000s in response to the Amerith Amerithrax attacks uh, and where we study, characterize, analyze, and develop countermeasures for biological threats to the homeland. We work closely with the CDC, FDA, HHS, and also our Department of Defense colleagues and many others. Yesterday, I shared the emerging results of our work that we're doing now with the Coronavirus Task Force. And today, I would like to share certain trends that we believe are important. If I may have the first slide, please. And while that's coming up, our most striking observation to date is the powerful effect that solar light appears to have on killing the virus, both surfaces and in the air. We've seen a similar effect with both temperature and humidity as well, where increasing the temperature and humidity or both is generally less favorable to the virus. So let me illustrate with this first slide. If you look to the right, you'll see that term half-life with a bunch of time stamps on there. Uh, first, let me tell you what a half-life is. We don't measure the virus as far as how long we'll live on a surface. We have to measure the decay of the virus in terms of its half-life because we, we, we don't know certain elements. We don't know how much a person expectorates when he, when he spits right, when he sneezes, whatever the case may be, we don't know how much a virus is in there. So it's, that, that has a, a long a bearing on how long the virus is gonna be alive and active. So we measure it in half-life, because half-life doesn't change. So if you look at an 18-hour half-life, what you're basically saying is that every 18 hours, the virus, the life of the virus is cut in half. So if you start with 1,000 particles of the virus, in 18 hours, you're down to 500, in 18 hours after that, you're down to 250, and so on and so forth. That's important as I explain the rest of the chart. If you look at the first three lines, when you see the word surface, we're talking about non-porous surfaces, door handles, stainless steel. And if you look at the, as the temperature increases and as the humidity increases with no sun involved, you can see how drastically the half-life goes down on that virus. So the, the virus is dying at a much more rapid pace just from exposure to higher temperatures and just from exposure to humidity. If you look at the fourth line, uh, you inject summer, the sunlight into that, you inject UV rays into that, the same effects on line two at 70 to 75 degrees with 80% humidity on the surface and look at line four, but now you inject the sun, the half-life goes from six hours to two minutes. That's how much of an impact the UV rays has on the virus. The last two lines are aerosols. What does it do in the air? We have a very unique capability. I was discussing this with the president prior to coming out. He wanted me to convey it to you on how we do this. I believe we're the only lab in the country that has this capability. But if you can imagine a Home Depot bucket, a five gallon Home Depot bucket, uh, we're able to take a particle, and this was de uh, developed and designed by our folks at the end back. We're able to take a particle of the virus and suspend it in the air inside of this drum and, and, and hit it with various temperatures, various humidity levels multiple different kinds of environmental conditions to include uh, sunlight and we're able to measure the decay of that virus while it's suspended in the air. This is how we do our aerosol testing. We work with John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab and we actually developed a larger drum to do actually more testing and it's four times the size of that. So this is the capability that we bring to this effort. So in summary, within the conditions we've tested to date, the virus in droplets of saliva survives best in indoors and dry conditions. The virus does not survive as well in droplets of saliva, and that's important because a lot of testing being done is not necessarily being done, number one, with the COVID-19 virus, and number two, in saliva or respiratory fluids. And thirdly, the virus dies the quickest in the presence of direct sunlight under these conditions. And when you, when you look at that chart, look at the aerosol as you breathe it. You put it in a room, 70 to 75 degrees, 20 percent humidity, low humidity, uh, it lasts, the half-life is about an hour, but you get outside and it cuts down to a minute and a half. Very significant difference uh, when, it, when it gets hit with UV rays. 
Mr. President, while there are many unknown links uh, in the COVID-19 transmission chain, we believe these trends can support practical decision making to lower the risks associated with the virus. If I could have my next slide, and when that while that comes up, you'll see a number of some practical applications. For example, increasing the temperature and humidity of potentially contaminated indoor spaces appears to reduce the stability of the virus. And extra care may be warranted for dry environments that do not have exposure to solar light. We're also testing disinfectants readily available. We've tested bleach, we've tested isopropyl alcohol on the virus, specifically in saliva or in respiratory fluids. And, and I can tell you that bleach will kill the virus in five minutes. Isopropyl alcohol will kill the virus in 30 seconds. And that's with no manipulation, no rubbing, just spraying it on and leaving it go. You rub it and it goes away even faster. We're also looking at other uh, disinfectants, specifically looking at the COVID-19 virus in saliva. This is not the end of our work as we continue to characterize this virus and integrate our findings into practical applications to mitigate exposure and transmission. I would like to thank the president, thank the vice president for their ongoing support and leadership to the department and for their work in addressing this pandemic. I would also like to thank the scientists, not only in S&T and the NBAC, but to the larger scientific and R&D community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Mr. Brian. A question that probably some of you are thinking of if you're totally into that world, which I find to be very interesting. So, supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. Uh, Steve, please. You say that the country will be in a better place by early summer. Does that mean you're going to need to extend the social distancing guidelines until then? Well, we may, and we may go beyond that. We're going to have to see where it is. And uh, I think people are going to know. You're going to know. I'm going to know. I think people are going to know just out of common sense. At some point, we won't have to do that. But until we feel it's safe, we're going to be extending. You have 23 cases where new cases, 23 states where new cases are on decline. What does that mean about when the country can be safely reopened to a, a more normal point? Yeah, but it means we're going to watch those cases very carefully. I think we've all gotten very good at it. We've gotten good at uh, tracing. We see where the cases are, where they're going, and we're going to be watching it. And it's called containment. At a certain point, we're going to be able to contain. And, uh, you know, when you see this, a lot of people have been talking about summer. Uh, maybe this is one of the reasons that we've uh, I once mentioned that maybe it does go away with heat and light and people didn't like that statement very much the the fake news didn't like it at all and I just threw it out as a suggestion but it seems like that's the case because when it's on a surface that would last for a long time when that surface is outside it goes away very quickly it dies very quickly with the Sun yeah go ahead um, you said yesterday that you're gonna look into Senator McConnell's suggestion for allowing states to declare bankruptcy versus the aid. Yeah, we'll look into it, and I have been looking into it. I've been talking to a lot of the different senators, but I don't want to talk about it now. That was a very interesting presentation. Go ahead, Jim. Well, I, I wanted to talk about McConnell's suggestion that aid to the states amounts to a I just told you I'm not talking about it now. I'll talk about it later. Okay. I'd like to talk about something that right now is of more interest to people. Could I ask Mr. Bryan a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. When you started your presentation, you described this as an emerging result. Does this mean your study is conclusive? Is there more work to do? We're continuing with that. For example, on the aerosol side, you notice the figures were 20% humidity. We're looking at higher humidity levels. We would expect that we even have a greater impact on the virus. We're looking at other types of disinfectants. Uh, and, and so we're, there, this is a, a we're, as a scientific community, we're continuing to study the virus to understand its characteristics. Mr. 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 Um, can you explain why some hot spots we've seen in the U.S. are hot and humid, like New Orleans, for example? Let me explain. If you, if you look at the coronavirus as a chain with many links, what we've done through our study is we've identified some of the weak links in that chain that the virus, the transmission of the virus depends upon. We identified that heat and humidity is a weakness in that chain. We've identified that sunlight, solar light, UV rays is a weakness in that chain. That doesn't take away the other activities, the guidance from the White House, the guidance from the CDC and others on the actions and steps that people need to take to protect themselves. This is just another another tool in our tool belt, right? Another, another weapon in the fight uh, that we can add to it. And in the summer, we know that summer-like conditions are going to create an environment 
where the transmission can be decreased, and that's an opportunity for us to get ahead. But I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, the, the, the president mentioned the idea of a cleaner system, bleach. And Governors who are opening their states, working on that, or incorporate the findings of this study into those guidelines. I would leave that up to the governors. This is a th this is a decision. This factors into their decision process. As I mentioned, with knowing this knowledge and having this knowledge, uh, as we continue to study and further know what the virus does and how it reacts, it could impact the way a governor will look at what he opens in a state, how he opens it, in what environments uh, these things are opened up. But I leave that up to the governors to make that decision. How they might suggest. Yes. Um, obviously, at the moment, the advice is stay at home. By the summer, could we be flipping that and saying you'd be much better off being outside with UV rays, all the humidity that uh, Washington brings in August? I, I would not go contrary to the guidance that have been issued right now. I think, though, to tell you that if, if, uh, if, if I'm having an event with my family, I'm doing it in the driveway or in the backyard, not inside the house. With my children. In fact, I'm thinking about moving outside to the <laughs> Rose Garden. No, it's a very interesting question, actually. Okay. Please. Uh, Mark, how much more research, how much more time would it take to have conclusive results that, that could be used here? You said these were emerging results. We, we first were able to receive the virus back in February is when we started testing. And uh, it is a science-based approach. Science is a process. The doctor can attest to that. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily line up with goals and targets and other things. It is what it is. Uh, but we are now starting to get results. And, and we're every week or two weeks, we're starting to find out something new and something different. Uh, and in talking to the, to, to the task force and the vice president, uh, he's already asked us to come to him every time we come up with some new discoveries that, that, we, could be, that we could share to the public. Bill? Yeah, sir, have you compared notes with your counterparts in other foreign governments or in private industry who might have been studying the same thing and do their findings show the same result that you found here? We have, we, we do have a very good partnership with uh, a lot of our allies. We work closely with them on this particular topic. Uh, we actually authored a document called the Master Questions List. If you go to DHS s and website, We've already had about 17,000 hits on this document. It actually outlines what all the countries in the world are doing to fill the certain gaps of knowledge that don't exist within the virus and what we do know. And that is really what targets and drives the science community to say, oh, wait, what don't we know now so we don't duplicate what other people have done? So we've championed that document. It's well referenced, and I would encourage you to look at that. And we are working with other countries on vaccines, as you know. Yeah, go ahead, please. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, okay. If there is a summer ebb with this virus, what would the federal government need to do to take advantage of that time? Say it at the beginning, right? Oh, so if there is a summer sort of ebb with this virus, what would the federal government need to do to take advantage of that time to be better prepared for a possible resurgence in the fall than we were the first well, time? I'll tell you one thing. I think a lot of people are going to go outside all of a sudden. People that didn't want to go outside, they'll be going. Uh, to me, this was a very, really a very interesting meeting. We covered it in great detail. And these are incredible people at that. We could call it a laboratory because that's essentially what it is. It's a super laboratory. It's a lot of things going on at that laboratory. Right, a lot of very you, interesting things going on at that laboratory. Yeah. What would you and other areas of the government need to do on testing, for example, or other things like that to be prepared if it came back in the fall? Uh, How would you take advantage uh, of the summer? Uh, it's, it's actually a very good question. It's something the task force already has begun discussing that we are um, if a combination of factors, let me say again, if states put into practice the guidelines to open up America again, uh, implement uh, a safe and responsible plans to open up their economies uh, along the lines that the president unveiled a week ago today, as people continue to properly exercise social distancing as, as is recommended in each phase, that in combination with some of these findings uh, could well give us a summer respite uh, from the coronavirus. And our team is already speaking about um, working on a continuous basis through this summer. Uh, every single day we're increasing testing. Uh, every single day airbridge flights are coming into the country. There, I, I can promise you at the President's direction there will be no letting up on, on making sure that uh, our hospitals have the equipment, uh, have the personal protective supplies for medical personnel, There'll be no letting up on the development of therapeutics uh, by our great pharmaceutical companies or driving toward uh, a vaccine as soon as it is possible to make available to the public. 
Um, and um, there'll be no letting up on continuing to scale testing. Already more than anyone in the world, but uh, by next fall we'll have a, a, a broad range of testing, a variety of different means. And that's why we say uh, with confidence that uh, should the coronavirus reemerge at any point uh, next fall or next winter, uh, we will be prepared to deal with it, uh, identify it, uh, do the contact tracing and isolation uh, to ensure that uh, that we we deal with this epidemic uh, in the manner that we uh, that we deal with infectious diseases. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Mr. President, on the subject of medical research, why have you stopped promoting uh, hydroxychloroquine as a cure? I have not know. What do you say? I have. We'll see what happens. We've had a lot of very good results, and we had some results that perhaps aren't so good. I don't know. Uh, I just read about one, but I also read many times good. Uh, so I haven't at all. And it's a, it's a great uh, for malaria, for lupus, for other things, and we'll see what it is. But I guess, uh, Deborah, they have many, uh, many studies going on on that. So we'll, we'll be able to have learn. Look at the veteran study yeah. that shows that the, I have not, the death no, I haven't rate is seen. higher. I have not seen it. Go ahead, please. Mr. President, uh, we're now over 26 million new jobless claims over five yeah. weeks. Yeah. How the vice president talked about this summer getting better, but how? What do your economists tell you about the the time it's going to take to the, to you in the U.S. to create? Well, I know a lot back. about economists. August, yeah. September, sure. October. Well, let me go. We we know the rest of the question, right? So, I I know a lot about economists, and the answer is they have no idea. I think I have as good an idea as anybody, and I think our economy will start to pick up very substantially as soon as the states get open, and that's happening as we speak, and it's actually very exciting, and uh, people are just just thrilled to see it because our country has to get back to work. They want to get back to work. You see that, whether it's a demonstration or just in talking to people. They're going to get back to work, and they're going to get back to work very fast. Uh, states are advanced. Uh, I look at uh, Gavin Newsom. Was, Newsom was very nice today. He wrote a beautiful statement about uh, we sent him a lot of a lot of things that he needed. Okay, things different things that he needed. We got we got to take in care of. They've done very well in California, as you know. They're doing really well in Florida. They're doing well in a lot of places. New York and New Jersey got hit very hard. They're doing very well. I spoke again with uh, Governor Cuomo, with uh, Governor Murphy. They're doing they're doing a great job. And here's the thing. We have to see. They got hit hard. Everyone close together, tight in. People don't realize New Jersey is very tight. You realize that because you've been covering it for a long time, but very tight. New York, obviously, is very tight. Uh, they're doing a terrific job. Uh, I, I think for the most part, I'll be able to tell you when it's all over, but a lot of the governors have done a really terrific job. Some I don't think have, to be honest, but uh, we'll be talking about it in the future. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. In a new interview today with Time Magazine, Dr. Fauci said that the U.S. is not uh, in a situation where we can say we are where we want to be with regard to testing capacity. He said we need much more testing capacity as well as tests. So why do you keep saying we have a tremendous testing capacity? And do we have a national strategy that goes beyond tracking just what the states are doing? The answer is yes. And the answer is, as you know, and as I've said many times, we're very advanced in testing. Other countries are calling us to find out what are we doing. And by the way, within two weeks, you'll see numbers and you'll see different forms of testing, just like we came up with the Abbott Laboratories machine, which gives it to you in five minutes that everybody wants. Everybody's asking, can we get that? But you can only make them so fast. Uh, but as you know, we've uh, done more testing than every other nation combined. And that's a big statement. And, you know, when they talk about different tests and different things, we're also a bigger nation than most. And so when they look at statistics, because statistically we're doing phenomenally in terms of uh, mortality, in terms of all of the different elements that you can judge. When you look, Germany and ourselves are doing very well. Uh, we are very accurate in the reporting of numbers. In fact, uh, I'll go a step further. As you know, in New York, they actually added quite a few uh, deaths to a list that was done in New York. And uh, they added a number of deaths. We're very, very uh, uh, highly accurate. And then you'll look at certain lists of other countries. Uh, some are so obvious just to look at, where obviously the number is ridiculous in the form of low. 
because they're not accurate counts. Uh, they're not even close to accurate counts. In fact, they're insulting to look at them. So uh, we've done very well. Again, testing, we're doing very well on testing. Uh, we've tested far more than anybody else anywhere in the world. And uh, within a short period of time, you'll be hearing about new tests that are coming out that are going to be incredible. Do you agree Steve, with Dr. Fauci that we're just not there uh, yet? No, I don't agree with him on that. No, I think we're doing a great job on testing. I don't agree. If he said that, I don't agree with him. Yes. Considering ways to get to ramp up production of that Abbott rapid test. Yeah, well, they're doing it. Uh, I'll tell you, Steve, they're, they're doing it. Uh, at a level that they've never done it before. Abbott is a great company. It's a very big, highly respected company. They came up with this machine where you do it. I've done it both ways. I've done it this way, and I didn't like it, and I've done it the Abbott way, where you literally just touch, and five minutes later, you know the answer. And we use them in the White House. I think you folks have been uh, given that opportunity, which is much more pleasant than the first way that they looked at you, right? Uh, we're making them hundreds of thousands of machines. Uh, the advantage to the other tests and the laboratory tests, so we can get millions and millions of those tests done. Uh, it takes a day or two days, but, you know, because it's really a delivery situation more than anything else. The test itself goes quickly once it gets to the laboratory. But as we have found and as we have, I think, shown everybody in the room, we have many laboratories. We have, we have so many laboratories. Nobody Nobody — a lot of the governors did not know that we had this capacity, but we have many laboratories all over our country. Every state has laboratories, and some have a lot of them. So I think we will uh, — we will come up with things as time goes by. Again, when I started, we ended up we, — we started with nothing, essentially. What — we started with a broken test, a test that didn't work. We started with a test that did very few people, not millions of people. The problem is, if we did 350 — if we did 350 million tests, one for each person, the media would say, oh, you should have done two for each person. No matter what you do, it doesn't make any difference. It's just like the ventilators. I talk about it all the time. Nobody ever mentions ventilators. One of the hardest things are ventilators. And now we're making thousands a week, thousands of ventilators, and they're calling from Mexico. They're calling from many countries. I've received today four calls. Would it be possible to send mm -hmm. ventilators, right? I got four calls today. I got three calls yesterday. Mm -hmm. No country is equipped like we are. We have 11 — we have 11 different places making ventilators. Uh, our country, as you know, doesn't need them now. Our governors are very happy. But that's different than tests, because with a test, you can always say, oh, we, we need more. No, I think we've done incredibly well uh, with obviously, with ventilators. We also have 500 million masks — 500 million masks uh, that are very shortly going to be here. We've uh, made millions of masks. We have ordered millions of masks that have arrived and been distributed. We gave one hospital in New York City 300,000 masks. Uh, before the virus, they were using 10,000. And now we got them 300,000, and they got rid of them very quick, which uh, — quickly, which I sort of say, how did that happen? Why? Because they became very valuable, the masks. So I say, how did that happen? But we got uh, — we have — we've done an amazing job, and we've worked with the governors. And when the governors weren't able — again, they're the first line. When they weren't able to get something, like ventilators, they couldn't get ventilators. They could have bought them. You could have bought them, but most of them, many of them chose not to. So they all needed ventilators, and we got the job done. We have — I'll be introducing the team when we're finished with this whole nightmare, this whole curse, this whole plague. But the team that worked on the ventilators was incredible. And the team that work — and it's a little bit interchangeable — but the team that's working on the testing is truly an incredible team. These are brilliant people. And they're doing it for the country. They're not doing it for other reasons. Some have been very successful. They're doing it for the country. Mr. President, yes. the House has not passed since you were here, the, uh, the relief bill. Right. Uh, I'll as be you signing know, it probably tonight. As you know, uh, there's no aid to states uh, and localities in that bill. Uh, Mitch McConnell, of course, has talked about uh, uh, states seeking bankruptcy uh, protection. Uh, he's also — his office referred to this as a — the idea of aiding states as a blue state bailout. What do, what do you say to that? Do you, do you agree with that, or do you agree with Governor Cuomo that that is a, a, a vicious attack on these states? That I don't think it's by? a vicious attack, but certainly some people do look at it that way. Uh, I've spoken to Mitch about it. I've spoken to numerous senators about it. And we're working with uh, senators that are 
on the other side of the issue, and we'll see what happens. But we're looking to do what's right for the people of this country. We're looking to do what's right for a particular state, and we'll see what happens. But it's certainly the next thing we're going to be discussing, because some states have — in all fairness, John, some states have not done very well for many years, long before the virus came. You know, you can't blame the plague, this horrible plague that came in, and all of a sudden, you know, they can't blame that. You look at Illinois. Now, he's got a lot of problems long before the virus came in. And uh, so we'll be talking about it. It'll be a subject for a period of time. And right now, we've uh, we've made this incredible deal for the workers and for small business. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Harvard uh, didn't get covered. We actually never sent them the check. Uh, but they were very nice about it. We never sent them the, the money. The old-fashioned way is the check. The new way is send them the money. And we didn't send them the money. And uh, — but they were very understanding, and they were very nice about it. So was Princeton, so was Stanford, so were a number of other schools that you just don't associate with this money. Uh, so were big companies, as you know. You know many of them. Uh, it was a relatively small amount of money compared to the whole, very small amount of money compared. But we wanted to be fair. We wanted to go to the people that it's supposed to go to. But are you open to this idea of, of state and local uh, I'm, open, I'm open to ideas that are going to be great for the people of this country. And if we can help states, we're always going to help states. Now, there's different ways of helping states. Some ways are better than others. So we're looking. Uh, it is interesting that the states that are in trouble do happen to be blue. It is interesting. You know, if you look around, I mean, the states that seem to have the problem happen to be Democrat. And uh, New Jersey got hit by this. You know, no, but New York and New Jersey were in a lot of trouble long before the plague came. And they were, you know, they had a lot of problems long before the plague came. I spoke with Governor Cuomo about it, spoke to Governor Murphy about it. I spoke with uh, Gavin Newsom about it. And uh, we sp I'm speaking to a lot of people about it, because it's probably going to be the next thing on the list. Uh, a lot of people understand very well what Mitch is saying, and they also understand the other side of the the uh, problem. And I'll be speaking about it. We're going to do the right thing for our country, the right thing for our country, and the right thing for a lot of great people. Okay? Yeah, yeah Mr. President, after the presentation we just saw about the heat and the humidity, is it dangerous for you to make people think they would be safe by going outside in the heat, considering that so many people are dying in Florida, considering that this virus has had an outbreak in Singapore? Places that are yeah, hot here, and here are we go. Here we go. The new, the new headline is Trump asks people to go outside. That's dangerous. Here we go. Same old group. Uh, you ready? I hope people enjoy the sun. And if it has an impact, that's great. I'm just hearing this, not really for the first time. I mean, there's been a rumor that, you know, a very nice rumor that you go outside in the sun or you have heat and it does have an effect on other viruses. But now we get it from one of the great laboratories of the world. I have to say, covers a lot more territory than just this. This is, this is probably an easy thing, relatively speaking, for you. I would like you to speak to the medical doctors to see if there's any way that you can apply light and heat to cure. You know, if you could, and maybe you can, maybe you can't. Again, I say maybe you can, maybe you can't. I'm not a doctor, but I'm like. A person that has a good, you know what? But, sir, you're the president. Deborah, have you ever heard of that? Uh, the uh, heat and the light, relative to certain viruses, yes, but relative to this virus, not as a treatment. I mean, certainly fever yeah. is a good thing when you have a fever. It helps your body respond, but not as I've not seen heat or light. I, I think it's a great thing to look at. I mean, you know, okay. Respectfully, sir, you're the president, and people tuning into these briefings, they want to get information and guidance and want to know what to do. They're hey, not looking for rumors. Hey, Phil. I'm the president, and you're fake news. And you know what I'll say to you? I'll say very nicely, I know you well. I know you well, because I know the guy. I see what he writes. He's a total faker. So are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? It's just a suggestion from a brilliant lab by a very, very smart, perhaps brilliant man, He's talking about sun. He's talking about heat. And you see the numbers. So that's it. That's all I have. I'm just here to present talent. I'm here to present ideas, because we want ideas to get rid of this thing. And if heat is good, and if sunlight is good, that's a great thing as far as I'm concerned. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. President, uh, you talked a moment ago about vaccines and that we're close. How close do you think the Oxford University study says they could have one by September? Do you think the pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. around They the could world, have one of what? They, they could have a vaccine ready yeah. 
Oxford's one, Johnson and Johnson is working. They're also working together. You have many companies working together on a vaccine. But then do you think they scale they can scale up production and the pharmaceutical companies will be able to do that quickly? Um, oh, oh, if, we'll scale it up. If, if we had a vaccine, it'll be scaled up very quickly. In fact, some of the companies, Johnson and Johnson is one, is scaling up already before they have the final answer. A number of companies are doing that. You'll save a lot of time. The normal is you scale up after. I have to say the FDA has been fantastic. Stephen Hahn, Dr. Hahn, has been fantastic. They're moving along rapidly, rapidly. Would you say, would it put a time scale on when no, you No, I don't want to put a time scale because then the, the uh, media, the so-called so -called media, lamestream media will say, he said a time, I don't want to say times because every time I say a time, if you don't hit it, they'll say, so I don't want to talk about time. But I will say that there's been tremendous progress made over the last month. And can I just ask a very quick question? You yeah. spoke to Boris Johnson this week. I, I did. just wonder how, how he sounded, how he was, I did. when do you think he'll be back at work? He called me a few days ago. Uh, I will tell you, he sounded incredible. I was actually surprised. I thought it'd be like, oh, Donald, how are you? He was ready to go. I, I could. I'm very surprised to tell you this. It's like the old Boris. Tremendous energy, tremendous drive. I was very surprised because he called me almost you know, pretty close to where, when he got out of the hospital. Uh, I think he's doing great. I think he's doing great. He was so sharp and energetic. Pretty incredible. He's an incredible guy. He's a friend of ours and, and a friend of mine. He loves our country. He loves his country a lot, but he loves our country. He respects our country. And uh, they're lucky to have him over there. Please. Oh, Mr. President, you a couple days ago said that you might reach out to Kim Jong-un directly, but also that you were working to find out if those reports about uh, him being in possible medical trouble were true. I'm wondering if you've either... I hope he's not in medical trouble. Well, I hope he's have not. Have you heard anything from North Korea? Or... very well with him. Yeah. Here we are. You would have been in a war with North Korea if I didn't get elected president. Remember, I was going to be the one that took us into war my first day in office, okay? Here we are. Look at what's happened. Withdrawal. We're bringing people home. We're not going to serve as policemen all over the world. I don't want to be policemen all over the world. But have you been able to learn and yet I've rebuilt our military to a level that has never been built at before. Have you but been it's able never to recognized by the fake news. Go ahead. Have you been able to use that relationship to get more information about his status? Uh, I think the report was incorrect. Let me just put it that way. I think the report was done by a network that uh, was uh, incorrect. I'm, I'm hearing they used old documents, uh, but I, I, that's what I hear. I hear the report was an incorrect report. Was I hope it was an in, incorrect report. When was the last time you heard from him? I don't want to say. Yeah. Since you pointed to me, uh, just a quick question about that. So you haven't made any contact, though, just to make sure. With who? The North Koreans. I don't want to say. I, I won't say that. Okay. Uh, we so have a good relationship with North Korea, as good as you can have. I mean, we have a good relationship with North Korea. Uh, I have a good relationship with Kim Jong-un, and I hope he's okay. And somebody would say, oh, that's terrible. No, it's not terrible. I hope he's okay. And I think it was a fake report done by CNN. So can I ask you a question? What do you have? Go I, ahead. I, I, no, that's I, enough. Go ahead. Can I ask but that was not my question. The problem is you don't write the truth. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I want, to go, I want to go to the next question. Can I ask you a question about Rick No, not CNN, please. Go ahead. The White House has not you don't, responded to the I told you. CNN is fake news. Don't talk to me. Go ahead, please. But he says he was retaliated against, and that's why he was removed from his job. Do you have a response to that? Okay, next question. Mr. President, I have two questions, one on behalf of a colleague who's not here because of social uh, Just ask one, please. First one, could you talk about your decision-making process on with the governor of Georgia? You yesterday the controversy? Said, well, you know, you, no. You said yesterday that you told the governor of Georgia you I were did. concerned I had a good talk with the governor of Georgia. Earlier in the week, you spoke, and you did not convey this kind of message. Was there a change uh, in your I did convey thinking? the message. I didn't like the fact that he's leaving certain things. I want the states to open more than he does, much more than he does. But I didn't like to see spas at this early stage, nor did the doctors. Is that a correct statement, Deborah? I didn't like to see spas opening, frankly. I didn't like to see a lot of things happening, and I wasn't happy with it. And I wasn't happy with Brian Kemp. I wasn't at all happy because and I could have done something about it if I wanted to, but I'm saying let the governors do it. But I wasn't happy with Brian Kemp. Spas, beauty parlors, tattoo parlors. I, no, I, that, that, and by the way, I want them to open, oh, excuse me, excuse me. I want them to open 
and I want them to open as soon as possible. And I want the state to open. But I wasn't happy with Brian Kemp. I will tell you that right now. Yeah, go ahead. So are you surprised he defied you on that? No, he didn't. He, no, he didn't defy me at all. That's your language. He didn't defy me. You know what happened? I said, you make your own decision. I told him that. I said, you're not in the guidelines, but I'm letting you make your own decision. But I want people to be safe. And I want the people in Georgia to be safe. And I don't want this thing to flare up because you're deciding to do something that is not in the guidelines. And I went to Deborah and Dr. Fauci and other people, and they weren't thrilled about it. And I could have stopped them, but I decided, and we all agreed, they got to watch it closely. So we'll see what happens. I told him very distinctly, I said, Mike was there, I said, you do what you think is best. But if you ask me, am I happy about it? I'm not happy about it, and I'm not happy about Brian Kemp. Go ahead. A question for Dr. Burks, if I may, Mr. President, uh, about the, the rate of the decline of the curve in the U.S. You and the Vice President tonight talking about meaningful progress, promising uh, progress. Uh, can, could you speak to the, the rate of decline of cases if, in the U.S.? If we US? could do it quickly, that'd be great. And just, uh, if, if you're, you, you if you're satisfied the with the I decline. Mean, you have to ask the question, but you do see it. And, and, and if you have any information from other countries that would inform us about the decline. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I, many of you, and I've spoken to all of you from this podium about there's weekends difference in reporting often a spike on Monday. If you look at Mondays over Mondays, if you look at seven-day reporting, we are starting to go down. We have a long, we had a long flat peak, um, largely driven, of course, by New York, which is about 45 or so percent of the cases. Um, as you, New York goes down, so will the rest of the country have a decline even more accelerated. I want to say, though, we have had outbreaks. We've had outbreaks in specific prisons. We've had outbreaks in specific nursing homes. We've had outbreaks in specific plants. And when that happens, that adds to 300, 400 cases on that single date. So we track very carefully not only what the country's doing, but what each state is doing, each county is doing. And we look at delta changes across all of the counties so that we find early warning signals for these types of outbreaks. Because we want to, we want the whole country to go down, but we also want to prevent the outbreaks before okay. they occur. Mr. President. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, looking forward to November, the election. Uh, given the risk that the flu and the coronavirus yeah, come back. A, there, 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 yeah, there could be a problem. Do you do you think there is a risk that there will be um, there will be some there will be lack of agreement, lack of legitimacy to the results in a very close election, and people start saying, well, a whole bunch of people couldn't go and vote because Look, they were I can't scared. tell you what's going to happen in an election. Yeah, I, a great question. I can't tell you what's going to happen. We have a sleepy guy in a basement of a house that the press is giving a free pass to who doesn't want to do debates because of COVID. And lots of things are happening, right? And I watched a couple of interviews, and I say, oh, I look forward to this. But they're keeping him sheltered because of the coronavirus. And he's not moving around. He's not moving too much. And then I watch what the press does to the Republican Party, and to me in particular. We had the greatest economy ever put together. We were doing — this is a month and a half ago. We were doing numbers of like, uh, likes of which we've never done. African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American, best employment numbers ever in the history of our country. Our employment numbers, the best in the history of our country, almost 160 million people. The stock market, record numbers, many, many times during my tenure. Many, many times. But now we have a country that we had to close because of this. And frankly, if we didn't close it, we would have lost millions of people, possibly. But certainly, we would have lost a million people. You take the high number and cut it in half, cut it in half again. But whether it would have been 600, 700, 800, you take a look at, at the travesty that there is. You take a look at this horrible, horrible scene of hospitals with bodies and black body bags, right? Multiply that times 10, 15, or even 20 because that would have happened. So we did the right thing. So far, we did the right thing. So far, we've called it right. We've mobilized like it was a military operation, and it was largely a military operation, between ventilators and testing and so many other things. And we've had a lot of good partners. Not all good partners, but we had a lot of good partners. Gavin Newsom today thanked us very much, Gavin Newsom. 
California thanked us so much for getting him all the things that he needed so he can keep going and keep doing a good job. We got it to him today. Tomorrow we're getting him even more. Uh, would have been harder for him to get it than us. We agreed to get it. We got it on time. He said promises made, promises kept. He actually said that in a statement today. We've done a good job. We've gotten very little credit for the great job we've done because of the media, because the media is not an honest media, in my opinion, much of it. Not all of it. We have some great reporters that I have tremendous respect, but much of the media is not honest. So I can't tell you about the election. You have a Democrat party and you have a large portion of the media automatically giving a guy a pass. He's been given a pass. Whether or not he's going to be the nominee, I have no idea, but he's getting a pass. And the media isn't covering the great job that we've done, whether it's Mike's task force, which has been incredible, whether it's the way we mobilized in a warlike operation to build these incredibly complex and very expensive ventilators. They're very expensive to build and very complex. The job we've done has been an amazing job. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about everybody. I'm talking about the generals, the admirals. Deborah and Tony and and now Bill. I mean, something we hadn't heard today. So I can't tell you what's going to happen with the election. I think that uh, had we not gone through a fake Russia, Russia, Russia deal, an impeachment hoax, it was a total hoax. From the day I got elected, but you know it wasn't the day, it was many months before I got elected. This has been a witch hunt that was illegal. It was an illegal witch hunt. It was illegal. And with all of that, I'm doing fine, because the people see we're doing a great job. And you know what? We'll continue to do a great job. If we had an honest press, this country would be even greater. Thank you. Thank you very much. About the legitimacy of the results. Another whistleblower complaint, Mr. President. That's what Rick Bright says he's going to file. Are you concerned about that? 